This is a short video to announce I have a new version of my analog discovery impedance analyzer software available for download. So the big change for this software is that I finally got an opportunity to test with an analog discovery version 2. So now the compatibility issue should have been fixed. And I just want to give a big thank you to Uli who was kind enough to lend me his analog discovery 2 so I could do this work. Dankeschön Uli. There's a download link in the description. It contains all the information you will need, including some instructions, details on how to build the plugin board. But I think I'll just do a quick run through of the software because the instruction document is not quite up to date. If we start over here, you can set the frequency of your measurement, set a start frequency and a stop frequency, or you can choose to set a center frequency and a span. Then we have the output, max amplitude, so this is currently locked at 200 millivolt peak to peak. What this means is whatever you're testing is never going to see more than 200 millivolt peak to peak. I kept this locked because it kind of worked well with this voltage. And with such a low test voltage it means you can also do in-circuit testing. However, the actual voltage across the device on the test is going to depend on the impedance that are doing the measurement. The 200 millivolts peak to peak is the maximum voltage before the shunt resistor. Then we have number of samples across the frequency range. Uh, you can select a value here, you can enter whatever you want. And we have speed. This was kind of a little bit experimental. I don't think there's any reason to set it to anything other than high. The lower speeds will capture more waves and give more averages, but in my experience it doesn't really make much difference. I usually just keep it on high speed. Then we have two settings over here, S1, S2. The top one decides when we're going to switch between the small shunt resistor and the medium shunt resistor, and the second one when we're going to go from the medium shunt resistor to the highest value shunt resistor. If you're having trouble getting a good measurement, it will often help to adjust these settings here. Then we have calibration, whether you want to use calibration during the measurement or not. And then we have a little bit experimental here, phase compensation. This is because when you're running higher frequencies, there's going to be a little bit of phase shift. So it will try to compensate for that. But as you can see the description here, it's only relevant for the open short calibration. And talking about calibration, so the first thing we need to do is to calibrate. And we see down in the status line here, it says currently we don't have any calibration available. So we click over here, calibrate, and it gives us two options, either the simple open short calibration, or we can do an open short reference calibration. So open short, well, I mean, it works fine in most cases, but it only gives us two reference calibration points, either shorted or completely open. Whereas the open short reference will give us the open, the shorted plus a reference resistance. Generally, you will get more accurate results with the open short reference, but you will need to use some kind of resistor. Uh, it's quite important to use an SMD resistor, something like an 805. Let's say you want to do a capacitor measurement, something like, for example, a one ohm resistor would be a good value for that measurement. Anyway, I'll just do a quick open short calibration for this demonstration. First, it asks us to prepare for open probes calibration. Here, I like to use a couple of resistors because it gives me a very accurate contact point on the Kelvin probes. And then we click OK. Then it will perform the open calibration on each of the three shunt resistors. For the open calibration, you would expect to see fairly high impedance values. If you get low ohm values here, there's definitely something wrong. Then we prepare for the shorted probes calibration. And again, I like to use a resistor with my Kelvin clips to get a very accurate contact point here. The higher accuracy you have, the better measurements you will get. I'll try to demonstrate that later. And click OK. And now you should expect to get very low 
own values. You see we're down in the milliohms here now. And that's it, the calibration is complete. So one thing worth noting is that the calibrated frequency range is the same as the setting we have here, start stop frequency, and the number of samples doing the calibration for each of the shunts is the same as the value we set up here. So now we have calibration, let's try to do a measurement. I've hooked up a capacitor here, and note that the Kelvin clips are very close to the body of the capacitor. So let's try to do this measurement. And here we go. And I'll just add a few more values here. Dissipation factor. And let's add the series capacitance as well. Now I'll try to do a second measurement and I'll select the second memory slot up here. This time I move the Kelvin clips just a few millimeters away from the body of the capacitor here. And then let's repeat the measurement. And here we go. And now we can do a comparison between the two measurements. And you can see here just a little bit of added inductance from a few millimeters of the capacitor pins is enough to move the resonant frequency here. You can see this one is 96 kilohertz and this one is 120 kilohertz. So this kind of demonstrates it's important when you do measurements to be consistent and the same when you do calibration, try to be consistent with the contact points. So you have eight memory slots available up here to compare measurements and also you can both import and export the measurement. So let's try export the current selected measurement. Just click export and just click save here. You can rename it if you want to. Uh, so it's going to save it in CSV format. We can take a look at that. Just click save here. And if we take a look at the file we just saved here, you can see the file is just in the standard CSV format and you have first line here tells you what data is. Uh, so if you want to do further work with the data, or maybe you want to create your own graphs in Excel or something like that, you can just import this data and use it as you see fit. So this of course means you can also reload all saved data. So we can try to clear it here and say we want to import the file we just exported here. So we will import the measurement and we can use it for comparison with other measurements, for example, or maybe you want to have a look at the details of some data. Okay, so I think there's one more feature maybe worth mentioning. So I've added this LCR mode. So first you'll choose a frequency, whatever measurement frequency you want, so five kilohertz and then click start. And then it will just continuously measure all and calculate all the parameters uh, for whatever you have attached. So this is good if you want to very quickly measure components or maybe you want to use it to probe around or something like that. Anyway, I think that's it. If you run into trouble or you have any questions, just leave a comment. I'll try reply as quickly as possible. But I've noticed sometimes I will miss comments because the YouTube comment notification system isn't 100% reliable. But anyway, I'll try to do my best to reply to all comments. So thanks for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. And I'll see you next time.